Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, a massive cyber outage causes global chaos. Airlines, retailers and banks affected. Iris Tao has more on what caused the problem and how the White House is reacting. American journalist Evan Gerskovich sentenced to 16 years in a Russian prison for espionage in a case denounced by the U.S. government as a sham. Arian Pazdar has how the Wall Street Journal and others are reacting. An attack drone hit the heart of Tel Aviv this morning, killing one and wounding 18. Find out who was behind the attack. Jason Perry has the Middle East update. Student borrowers enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan won't be receiving the lower monthly payments they were expecting. Arlene Richards explains why. And parents are fighting against a Louisiana law requiring all public schools to display the Ten Commandments. It's now on hold while a lawsuit plays out. This is NTD Evening News, live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City. Here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. A cyber outage today related to issues at global cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike affected media, retailers, banks and airlines across the globe. NTD's Iris Tao has more from the long lines at Milwaukee's International Airport. Over 2,000 flights were canceled on Friday after a wave of IT outages swept across the U.S. this morning. And while many attendees of the Republican National Convention also found themselves stuck here in Milwaukee. It's just a total mess. It's not anything to do necessarily with the airlines, but you just have to be patient. The disruption was the result of a faulty software update pushed by American cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike. Computers running Microsoft Windows, a CrowdStrike client, were crashing as a result. And CrowdStrike says the issue has been fixed and that it's not a security incident or a cyber attack. But the airline industry was hit hard due to its sensitivity to timings. Other sectors were also affected. 911 and emergency services were down in several states, including New York, New Hampshire, and Arizona. Banks, hospitals, and companies around the world also had IT disruptions. Some tech titans, including Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, said they would stop using CrowdStrike. The White House says President Biden has been briefed from a CrowdStrike outage, and his team is engaged with different agencies to get sector-by-sector sector updates and is standing by to help as needed. Reporting from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Iris Tao, NTD News. Reactions are pouring in after Russia sentenced an American reporter to 16 years in jail today. He is the first U.S. journalist arrested on spying charges in Russia since the Cold War. This as a foreign leader addresses the U.K. cabinet for the first time in almost 30 years. NTD's international correspondent Arian Pastar brings us the updates. A Russian court found Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich guilty of espionage charges on Friday. He's been sentenced to 16 years in jail. The White House released a statement saying Gershkovich, quote, committed no crime. Rather, he was targeted by the Russian government because he's a journalist and an American. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. is working to secure his release and praised the Biden administration for freeing over 30 Americans from across the globe in the last three years. We're working it. We're working it as we speak, and we're not going to stop until we get Evan home, we Paul Whelan home till we get others home. The CEO of the Dow Jones and publisher of the Wall Street Journal on Friday also said Gershkovich wasn't guilty of the crime. Uh, this is a sham trial, sham proceedings, uh, sham charges. We will not be scared away from pushing for his release. A reporter on Friday asked the Kremlin about a possible prisoner exchange with the U.S. in the future. A spokesperson replied this. I'll leave your question unanswered. And people in New York also reacted to the ruling. I'd like to see a strong reaction from um, top down. This is really a tough decision because the whole situation worldwide is already pretty tense. Russian prosecutors had alleged that Gershkovich gathered secret information for the CIA about a Russian company that makes tanks. Also on Friday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky addressed British government ministers. We must deprive Putin of money and capability to produce more, more weapons. 
The last foreign leader to address the cabinet was President Bill Clinton in 1997. Prime Minister Keir Starmer hopes the special visit will underline London's support for Ukraine. Now we will stand with you and the people of Ukraine for as long as it may take. Zelensky asked Western allies to allow Ukraine to use long-range missiles against Russia. He says Britain should try to convince its partners to remove the limits. Arian Pastar, NTD News. An attack drone hit the heart of Tel Aviv this morning, killing one and wounding 18. Meanwhile, the top UN court ruled that Israel's alleged occupation of Palestinian territories is illegal. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. In a video released on Friday, you can see a drone flying right into the center of Tel Aviv and then exploding. The Israeli military said it was an attack drone that hit a building, killing one person and injuring 18 others. I was dead asleep and I, I came from Safat, so I know the sound of rockets and I used to sleep through them. There were so many, but this sound of this drone was like a vibration that woke me right up and then the explosion rattled the whole building. I thought I, the, our building got hit because everything was falling from the ceiling and the windows blew out in my room. The Israel Defense Forces gave an update. After an initial investigation that we carried out and from the findings at the scene and on the military systems, it appears that it is an unmanned aircraft of the Samad 3 model. Our estimation is that it arrived from Yemen to Tel Aviv. And the Houthi terrorist group in Yemen indeed claimed responsibility for the attack on Tel Aviv on Friday during a rally in support of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. A Houthi spokesman said the people of Yemen got what they wished for, the death of Israelis by the Yemeni military. As Israel continues to face attacks from multiple countries, it now finds itself condemned by the top United Nations court. On Friday, the International Court of Justice ruled that Israel's alleged occupation of Palestinian territories is illegal, although the ruling is not legally binding. The presiding judge added this. Consequently, Israel has an obligation to bring an end to its presence in the occupied Palestinian territory as rapidly as possible. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posted this on X after the court's decision. The Jewish people are not occupiers in their own land. No absurd opinion in The Hague can deny this historical truth or the legal right of Israelis to live in their own communities in our ancestral home. Meanwhile, the Israeli government is set to call up 1,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews for military service on Sunday. They have previously been exempt from Israel's mandatory service until Israel's Supreme Court recently ruled that they must also serve like the majority of Israelis. Jason Perry, NTD News. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today that a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas was within sight. He told the Aspen Security Forum in Colorado that negotiators were, quote, driving toward the goal line. He added that some issues still need to be negotiated and resolved. Taiwan's foreign minister said today that the island must rely on itself for defense. This follows former President Trump's comment that Taiwan should pay the U.S. for its defense. Trump told Bloomberg that the U.S. is, quote, no different than an insurance company, adding Taiwan is able to pay because they're immensely wealthy. Ever since Taiwan began to democratize, over the past 30 years, we have often faced the threat of China alone. Lin added that Taiwan's defense spending has reached historic highs, standing at 2.5 percent of its GDP, adding that he expects this figure to continue to rise. The Chinese Communist Party claims Taiwan as its own, despite never having ruled the island. Washington maintains a vague stance whether it would defend the island in the case of a Chinese invasion, which is called strategic ambiguity. The Biden administration today announced it would place debt-saving loan plans into an interest-free forbearance. Entities Arlen Richards learned why the Education Department is pausing $8 billion in student debt relief. 
Education Secretary Miguel Cardona announced on Friday that 8 million borrowers enrolled in a newly created repayment plan would be placed in an interest-free forbearance. This comes after a federal appeals court on Thursday temporarily blocked the plan that the Biden administration launched last year. The survival of the plan, called SAVE, is questionable as it's recently gone through some changes. Republican-led states are challenging the plan's goal to lower borrowers' monthly payments and provide a faster route to debt forgiveness. They argue that the Biden administration overstepped its authority when it implemented the plan. Courts in Missouri and Kansas put a freeze on different parts of the plan in late June, stopping the administration from canceling any more debt or lowering payments. The SAVE plan is one of several income-driven plans designed to keep monthly payments low. It provides the most generous terms, especially for low-income borrowers. Borrowers currently enrolled in SAVE can remain in the plan while the merits of the cases are heard. Their monthly payment amounts should remain the same. Meanwhile, on Thursday, Biden announced another round of student loan debt forgiveness totaling $1.2 billion for 35,000 public sector workers. In a separate lawsuit, the administration is asking the Supreme Court to allow them to continue implementing the SAVE plan while the litigation fully plays out. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Implementation of a Louisiana law requiring the Ten Commandments to be displayed in all public school classrooms now delayed until at least November. This will allow a lawsuit against the legislation to play out in court. The plaintiffs, which include parents of public school students in Louisiana, claim the law violates the First Amendment. They say that the legislation is not neutral with respect to religion and infringes on religious liberty. Louisiana school boards and education officials have agreed to not implement the law until at least November 15th, but the lawsuit will not affect the deadline for all public schools to post the commandments by January 1st. Similar laws have been struck down in the past in Kentucky, but upheld in Texas. Proponents of the legislation say the Ten Commandments do not violate freedom of religion because they are a part of U.S. history. There's been a 50 percent drop in border encounters over the past six weeks, and data shows illegal crossings are currently at their lowest point since President Biden took office. Democrats still plan congressional action on immigration if Biden is reelected, while Republicans aim to revive former President Trump's policies and deploy the U.S. Navy to stem the flow of fentanyl. NTD's Melina Weiskup reports. Encounters at the border have dropped for four months in a row, according to Border Patrol data, with June having the lowest number of the entire Biden administration. Customs and Border Protection reported a 50 percent drop over the past six weeks. Around 1,900 people are crossing daily. That's still over the average of 1,500 a day for seven days, which is required in order to relax the restrictions put in place by the Biden administration back in May. The administration says the new policy is deterring migrants. 50,000 people have been deported since that order took effect, and Republicans have a plan to top that if they take back the White House. The RNC platform calls for the largest deportation in history and a return to Trump-era policies, which the former ICE director says were highly effective. Under President Trump, we cut illegal immigration by 90 percent, the lowest level in 45 years. Deportations rose to the highest level ever, including historic numbers of illegal alien gang members and criminals. The Republican platform also wants to use the U.S. Navy in order to impose a full fentanyl blockade on the waters of our region. Alternatively, the Democrats' newly adopted platform is to push for congressional action that will secure the border, reform the asylum system, expand legal immigration, and support long-term undocumented individuals, including DREAMers. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. The Department of Justice is suing Texas housing provider Southwest Key Programs that's over allegations of sexual abuse and harassment of unaccompanied migrant children. According to the DOJ, employees at Southwest Key allegedly sexually abused migrant children in their care from at least 2015 to 2023. This allegedly included rape, solicitation of nude photos, inappropriate touching and more. The government lawsuit now seeks relief for the children who have suffered alleged abuse. 
It also aims for reforms to ensure no child in the shelters will be abused in the future. Southwest Key responded, saying the provider's primary focus is the safety, health, and well-being of the children. The company is now reviewing the complaint, adding that the allegations do not represent an accurate picture of the care its employees provide. Welcome back. The, the Republican National Convention wrapped up last night. NTD's Dana Monahan reports on the speech by former President Trump and others on the convention's final day in Milwaukee. Former President Trump discussed the aftermath of the attempt on his life. He said he wanted to do something to let people know he was okay. I raised my right arm, looked at the thousands and thousands of people that were breathlessly waiting and started shouting, fight, fight, fight. In an emotional moment, as the crowd cheered Corey, Trump paid his respects to former fire chief Corey Comparator, who threw his body over his family as bullets flew by. Trump says his journey with the American people nearly ended that day. But if the events of last Saturday make anything clear, it is that every single moment we have on Earth is a gift from God. The former president says the attacker in Pennsylvania wanted to stop their movement. But the truth is the movement has never been about me. It has always been about you. It's your movement. It can't be stopped. It has always been about the hardworking, patriotic citizens of America. Trump says he's running to be president for all of America, not half of America. Together we will launch a new era of safety, prosperity, and freedom for citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed. The discord and division in our society must be healed. We must heal it quickly. As Americans, we are bound together by a single fate and a shared destiny. We rise together or we fall apart. The former president outlined his plans for the country. Republicans have a plan to bring down prices and bring them down very, very rapidly by slashing energy costs. And remember, we have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country by far. We are a nation that has the opportunity to make an absolute fortune with its energy. Professional wrestler Hulk Hogan said there was so much energy at the convention that he thought he was at Madison Square Garden getting ready to win another world title. And they tried to kill the next president of the United States. Enough was enough. And I said, let trump -mania run wild, brother. Let trump -mania rule again. Let trump -mania make America great again. Journalist Tucker Carlson said Trump didn't say a single word about himself when he reached out to him hours after the assassination attempt. Carlson says Trump expressed his amazement that the crowd didn't run. And I thought two things. The first thing I thought was, well, of course they didn't run. His courage gave them heart. A leader's courage gives courage to his people. And the second thing I thought was, this is the selfish guy I've been hearing about for nine years, really? Not a word about himself? Carlson said Trump is no longer just a political party's nominee or a former or future president. He is now a leader of a nation. When he stood up after being shot in the face, bloodied, and put his hand up, I thought at that moment, that was a transformation. Ultimate Fighting Championship President Dana White also spoke, and Kid Rock performed. Now that the convention is a wrap, it's back to the campaign trail. Trump will be holding a rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan on Saturday with his new running mate, J.D. Vance. Vance will then head to his home state of Ohio on Monday. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. RNC delegates and lawmakers on Capitol Hill are reacting to the former president's speech. Plus, European leaders also weighed in on Trump's presidential prospects. Entity's Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, has more on this story. 
Delegates at the Republican National Convention praised former President Donald Trump for his speech Thursday night. For many, it was a message of Republican unity not seen in many years. All right, well, I believe President Trump promoted a vision of unity and prosperity that all Americans can achieve. To those at the convention center in Milwaukee, there was a marked change of tone in the president's speech after the assassination attempt. I think we've had a huge change in his tone. I think he gave a great speech tonight, especially uh, after everything that happened to him um, in Pennsylvania. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries hit back at those praising former President Donald Trump. On a social media post, Jeffries wrote that Republicans will end Social Security and Medicare as we know it. Is that unifying? While leaders of allied nations discuss how Trump's political message affects NATO, like Finnish President Alexander Stubb, who shares President Trump's vision of peace through strength. Am I worried? No, because the United States wants to remain a superpower. And in order for it to do so, it needs to stay committed to Europe and to NATO. Is there a rebalancing going on? Yes, Europe needs to take care of its defense more. I think one of the reasons that Finland joined uh, is that we give value added to the alliance with our strong defense. And I think I'm sure that both President Trump and his vice president candidate, uh, J.D. Vance, uh, will take note. While others, like the Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander de Croo, who believe that Trump's message of unity and progress will always put America first. I think whoever wins in the, in the U.S. race, uh, it will be, whoever wins, it will be more America first. What we see now in the, in the Republican uh, convention confirms that. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The chair of the House Oversight Committee has subpoenaed the head of the Secret Service, compelling her to testify on Monday. The Secret Service is facing growing scrutiny over its security preparations and reactions to the assassination attempt on former President Trump. The DHS Inspector General will investigate the agency's operations at last weekend's rally. A group of senators confronted the Secret Service head at the RNC convention Wednesday, demanding answers about the rally shooting. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has updates on the investigations. Investigators combing through evidence have still not determined a motive in last week's assassination attempt on Trump. Administration officials told Congress this week during briefings, Thomas Crooks conducted online searches about major depression, had photos of President Biden and Trump, and researched dates of both parties' national conventions. Lawmakers briefed on the matter say the suspect seems to have visited the rally site twice before the event. A local official says police responded to a call about a suspicious mail before Trump took the stage. Republican Senator Mike Lee says law enforcement identified the shooter as suspicious a full 19 minutes before the shooting. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell on X called for new leadership at the Secret Service after leaving the briefing. Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle told CNN the Secret Service was solely responsible for implementation and execution of security at the event. A Secret Service spokesman told NBC News it was notified of a suspicious person, possibly carrying a backpack and golf rangefinder. He said there's a big difference between a suspicious person and a threat. Trump's adult son, Eric Trump, defended Secret Service agents in recent interviews, saying they demonstrated on stage they would take a bullet for his dad. The Secret Service Chief of Communications says Cheadle has no plans to resign. Cheadle will testify at a House Oversight Committee hearing on Monday. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Thousands attended a memorial for Corey Comparatore, the firefighter killed at former President Trump's rally. Mourners came from all walks of life yesterday to pay tribute to the man many are calling a hero. A banquet hall in Freeport, Pennsylvania, was filled with Corey Comparatore's family and friends and many people who didn't know him at all. They were there to grieve, but also to celebrate the life of the former fire chief. Comparator was killed shielding his wife and daughters during the assassination attempt at former President Trump's rally in Pennsylvania last week. Fire trucks and police vehicles filled the parking lot outside the building. A Pennsylvania firefighter called what Comparator did hero worthy. He said there was a lot of sadness in the banquet hall. You know, it even it even got to me, to be honest, because, you know, that's somebody who's in your line of work. Mm -hmm. And he's also a father figure, you know, and that's just something that gets to you. If you don't have emotions, you shouldn't be on earth, to be honest. Pittsburgh resident John Ruffley attended Trump's rally on Saturday, but left before the shooting occurred. He said it was important for him and his family to pay their respects. 
I hope it sends a message that we support each other, we stick together as Americans, regardless of, you know, what someone's political affiliations are. Inside the hall, a projector screen displayed photos from Comparator's life, the time he spent with his children and his pets, his wedding day, and fishing on the lake. Mourner stopped by Comparator's casket to pay tribute. Outside the venue, a truck fitted with video screens showed a photograph of Trump raising his fist after being shot. A childhood friend of Comparator spoke to the media. I don't know that we still know everything that happened, but um, I'm sure eventually we'll get to the bottom of it. I uh, wish President Trump, former President Trump, the best of luck in the election. I know I'll be voting for him, and I'm sure Helen and the girls will be too. A copy of the note Trump and former First Lady Melania Trump sent to Comparator's wife was on display. It read, Corey will forever be remembered as a true American hero. A private funeral will be held today. Tomorrow will mark the 25th anniversary of Communist China's brutal persecution against the spiritual practice Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. Practitioners from around the world are marking the occasion by raising public awareness. NTD's Sam Wang has the story. With decades of hardships come decades of resilience. Just days away from July 20th, Falun Gong practitioners from across the globe have been commemorating this somber occasion. It was on this day 25 years ago, the Chinese Communist Party ordered a nationwide persecution against the spiritual practice, seeking to eradicate the tens of millions who live by the principles of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. The State Department said it's an issue that demands action. We have seen uh, uh, the PRC take a number of, of steps uh, as, uh, over the past many years that we view as a crackdown on, on basic human rights. Uh, one, it is something that we will continue to raise with PRC officials directly. And two, uh, we won't hesitate to take appropriate actions from the U.S. government, and you've seen us uh, done so. But the persecution of practitioners of Falun Gong should not be tolerated by over the past week, Falun Gong practitioners have held rallies in different parts of the world to raise the public's awareness, from local towns and villages to large cities like Tokyo, Sydney and Washington, D.C. But in China, the story is quite different. Authorities track practitioners and send them to labor camps. Some are left bedridden due to severe abuse and torture, and others have died in custody. State Department reports suggest an untold number of Falun Gong practitioners have had their organs harvested on demand to supply China's transplant industry. The persecution of Falun Gong is criminal. The arbitrary detention, torture, forced labor, propaganda and organ harvesting associated with this campaign are not only violations of international human rights standards, but also constitutes criminal acts that demand global condemnation. Today, getting the truth out remains a top priority for Falun Gong practitioners. In many instances, their voices are being heard. In June, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Falun Gong Protection Act, a bill aimed at sanctioning foreign nationals who are complicit in China's state-sponsored organ harvesting. Despite facing adversity inside communist China, Falun Gong is now practiced by people from all walks of life in over 100 countries. Sam Wang, NTD News. Joining us now to discuss the Chinese regime's brutal persecution of Falun Gong practitioners is Larry Liu, Deputy Director of Government and Advocacy at the Falun Dafa Information Center. Larry recently had an article published in The Diplomat titled 25 Years On, Falun Gong Still Firmly in Beijing's Repressive Sites. Talks about the status of the persecution a quarter of a century after the Chinese regime began its suppression. Larry, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you here. Now, to begin, in your article in The Diplomat, you found Chinese Communist Party documents and directives that reveal one of Beijing's top priorities is the persecution of Falun Gong. Could you share the key points from your research here? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, we studied dozens of uh, internal documents from the CCP, and uh, you know many of them are leaked outside, but some of them are their work plan directives and uh, you know work report and uh, we can find from their website but most of them are leaked internal documents and all of them shows that Falun Gong may, remains the top target of CCP's so-called maintaining national political security 
and is often placed ahead of Xinjiang, Tibet, and other enforcement area. And part of the reason is Falun Gong practitioner over the past 25 years launched one of the largest, uh, actually the largest civil disobedience and information freedom movement in modern Chinese history. So when this persecution first started, then Communist Party leader Jiang Zemin claimed that he could eradicate Falun Gong within three months. But now, 25 years later, 300 months passed, and all of these internal documents shows that their efforts to wipe out Falun Gong in China has categorically, categorically failed. On that note, how expansive is this persecution campaign? How large is the scale inside of China? Sure. Uh, this is one of the largest, most brutal, and longest running human rights atrocities in modern Chinese history. And just give you a few statistics. Over the past 25 years, millions of Falun Gong practitioners have been thrown into jail, labor camp, detention facilities. And uh, there are widespread torture and abuses. And uh, so far, we have documented over 5,000 deaths due to the persecution. And But the real number could be much higher because these are the only the people we know their name, we know their uh, you know, how they die, their family members send the information out, which is very hard and take a lot of risk. So the true number could be much higher. And also in 2019, China Tribunal, when they testify to the United Nations Human Rights Council, and they estimated hundreds of thousands of people have been killed through forced organ harvesting in China, a majority of them were Falun Gong practitioners. In recent years, we hear more and more about transnational repression of the Chinese diaspora living overseas, which is extremely concerning. Is the Chinese Communist Party targeting Falun Gong outside of China as well? Definitely. Uh, actually, this is uh, one of their top target of transnational repression over overseas. And uh, so, you know, uh, we studied their internal documents, and so their internal documents shows that they have a very detailed plan about how to combat Falun Gong overseas. And that's one of their top priorities in this whole campaign. And for example, one of their uh, strategy is uh, what they collect a lot of the database of overseas Falun Gong practitioners, their bio biometrics and their family members' information inside China, and they want to use that to pressure the Falun Gong practitioner overseas uh, to stop their activities. And uh, in a 2017 uh, leaked document from the CCP, and they listed out their play playbook, basically. One of them is uh, they want to de develop uh, non-governmental sources such as uh, China-friendly uh, experts, uh, uh, journalists, and uh, you know scholars, and to speak for them and try to uh, strive to uh, make foreign media to report favorably to them on Falun Gong issues. So in the earlier years, uh, their transnational repression on Falun Gong mostly taken, you know, very violent forms. And for example, they attack Falun Gong practitioners uh, physically in front of Chinese embassy consulate. And I remember back in 2008, uh, then Chinese Consul General Peng Keyu uh, was caught on tape actually instigating violent mobs to attack Falun Gong practitioners on the street of uh, Flushing, Queens in New York. But in recent years, it becomes more and more sophisticated. It is almost part of their unrestricted warfare uh, playbook. And uh, so they use, uh, try to use Americans, American scholar media uh, to you know, defame Falun Gong, send out propaganda disinformation campaign to deter would-be supporters. And so this is kind of a, you know, and last year the DOJ indicted two Chinese agents for uh, you know, trying to bribe a purported IRS official who are actually, uh, you know, undercover FBI uh, investigator actually. And uh, so try to bribe that person and to, to strip down a nonprofit status of a Falun Gong organization. So it's become more and more sophisticated in recent years. And Larry, on that note, you've spent 25 years advocating on the policy level in Washington, D.C. for the persecution to end have there been any recent breakthroughs? Oh, definitely. You know, just like uh, your earlier reporting that uh, last month, uh, the House of Representatives passed uh, unanimously the Falun Gong Protection Act. Uh, in over the past 25 years, the House has pop, uh, passed uh, five resolutions in support of Falun Gong condemning the persecution. But this Falun Gong Protection Act uh, is the first binding bill that uh, the House passed. And now the bill is in Senate. The bill basically has a, a several major 
you know, uh, action items. Uh, one of them is a sanction uh, of, you know, banning the visa and freezing asset for those uh, CCP officials involved in forced organ harvesting. So this bill certainly will curb, curtail the forced organ harvesting in China, certainly give hope to a lot of Falun Gong practitioners still suffering in China. And Larry, right now there are so many awful things going on in the world. For some, this issue may seem too far from home. Tell us, why should the persecution of Falun Gong in China matter to Americans? Sure, you know, very good question. Um, maybe I'll just give you a one story. Last week, I accompanied a young man from Arizona and uh, to visit his congressman and senator office last week. And his father is in jail in Shanghai right now. And he was sentenced uh, for four years in prison for being a Falun Gong practitioner for his faith. And um, during his, you know, he's currently still in jail. And uh, when uh, this young man, Jiang, and his mother visited his father in jail, and she found out that her uh, his hands are completely blue. And later on, she learned from his lawyer that he was forced to do slave labor in prison. And he was forced to work like 12 hour, hours a day to make jeans. And so this just made me think, uh, you know, most of the most of the things we buy from a department store, from say Walmart Targets, and most of them are made in China. So how many of them were made by people like John's father, you know, or other following practitioners jailed for their face and, and work as a slave labor working 12, 14 hours a day without any pay? And so this persecution is far closer to Americans living room than most people can imagine. And also, uh, I remember that when this pandemic first started, uh, David Mattis, a uh, renowned international human rights lawyer, and he's also one of the lead uh, investigator of forced organ harvesting in China. And he said something like this, and he said, if the international community didn't ignore forced organ harvesting in China, and instead, force China's health healthcare system to be more transparent, we wouldn't have this cor uh, coronavirus pandemic at all. So I remember, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I think that's true not only, you know, philosoph uh, philosophically, but also literally it is true too. Larry Liu, Deputy Director of Government and Advocacy at the Falun Dafa Information Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, plenty going on today, but let's start overseas at golf's British Open Championship where Tiger Woods missed the weekend cut today. When can we expect to see him play next? You know, it sounds like December. You know, this is actually already the last major of the year, and he said he would play the four majors, and he did. They didn't really go very well, though. No, he did make the cut at the Masters, but then missed the cut at the PGA Championship, the U.S. Open, and now the British Open. And the, this British Open was especially tough on him. He was 14 over through two rounds. The cut was six over, so he really wasn't close. Finished 145th out of 154 golfers. Now the positive was that he was actually able to play the events this year without really noticeably limping around the course. Maybe if he gets more practice time in, we'll see flashes of his old self, though I will warn you, he is 48 years old. Now, although he's not playing another P uh, official PGA event this year, he is playing in a, a couple of unofficial ones in December. So hopefully he'll spend more time practicing and maybe next year's British Open will go better. Well, the leader after two rounds at the British Open is former champion Shane Lowry. Despite him carding a double bogey today on the 11th, what happened there? Yeah, that was an unusual sequence. Now, he hit his second shot into the spectators where there was some very thick grass. He set a photographer in front of him, raised his arm as he swung, and that distracted him, thus the bad shot. Anyway, he couldn't find the ball, so he, had to, he hit what's called a, provis a provisional shot near the area, hit it very well, but then a fan found his original ball, so then he had to take a penalty and then hit like a blind shot behind these bushes. Now, we call it a blind shot because he couldn't see the green when he was shooting, let alone the hole. Still had a great shot, though, onto the green. Ended somehow with a double bogey. It could have been much worse. So he's the leader at seven under through two rounds. Meanwhile, number one, Scotty Scheffler, is five shots back in a three-way tie for fourth place. 
Now tonight, the baseball season resumes after a four day all star break. What do you see as some of the top storylines this second half? You know, I think uh, Pittsburgh rookie Paul Skeens, can he go from being starting the year in the minor leagues to winning a Cy Young award? I mean, he's already the third, uh, already has the third best betting odds to do it. And he's only made 11 starts this year. He's just been so dominant, but that would be an incredible story if he can complete that and win the Cy Young. Now, another storyline is where Shohei Otani can win his third MVP in four years, but this time as a hitter only. Now, his previous two, he was a hitter and a pitcher, um, but he leads the, as a hitter, he leads the NL in a number of offensive categories, talking about runs, home runs, plus slugging percentage. And also a third storyline, I think, in the American League is can Aaron Judge challenge his home run record in the American League of 62 he set two years ago. He's at 34. That puts him on pace through for 57. I mean, even if he only gets in the 50s, that would be like his uh, third 50-plus home run season. Only five players have ever done that. So I think those are at least three things we'll be watching this second half of the season. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. The first Olympic athletes arrived in Paris yesterday and began checking into the Olympic Village. Final preparations are underway before the Games begin with the opening ceremony on July 26th. Entities Andrew Thomas has the latest. Athletes from Australia, South Africa, Japan, Uruguay and the United States were some of the first to arrive at the Olympic Village. <laughs> They'll be staying in Saint-Denis the northern suburb of Paris, where most of the competitions will be held. We had an opportunity to do a scratch match against Ireland and Uruguay, so it's good to get a bit of a hit out, get some get some hits in the body. Yeah, I think that opportunity to represent a country at the highest level, and obviously to meet all the different athletes and um, watch the, 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 the sport at this level. I think I'm really looking forward to it, different types of sports. American archer Casey Koffold was looking forward to exploring the Olympic Village campus. I'm excited to get checked in, see the rooms, get all the clothes and everything, and just get a lay of the land. It's beautiful out today, and so we are here at about lunchtime, so we're going to want to stay awake till um, it's time to go to sleep. So definitely just going to keep ourselves occupied, you know, getting to see everything here at the village. <laughs> The Olympic Village will host more than 20,000 athletes and delegates throughout the Olympics and Paralympics. The complex is complete with lounges, a club, laundry facilities, a massive dining hall, its own post office, and even a hair salon. The director of the Olympic and Paralympic Villages said only 1,500 residents will check in on the first day. More will arrive throughout the week. Yes, I think everything is open now, so uh, all the services uh, are now available. Uh, it's a slow start because we will have only 1,500 uh, residents tonight, so it's like 10% of the village, but it's only the first day. The Olympic Games will start on July 26th and last until August 11th. The Paralympics begin August 28th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.